And uh, as, as usual with, uh, with most of these panels, um, we're going to kick off just with a couple of live polling questions. Uh, and the first one just relates to your view on, uh, uh, sorry, your, what your biggest concern is regarding Australian equities at the moment. Uh, so if you could just take some time having a look at that. The first one's markets are fully valued. Um, government regulation obviously coming into play with the budget in recent times uh, for the banks. Sustainability of di dividends. Um, the death of local retailers, which again is something that's, that's come about um, uh, through, the, um, through global, um, the global trade. And obviously, you know, the last one is um, you're completely comfortable with those equities and have no concerns at all. Um, so, and the second one is, is very much related to the work that we're, you know, we're kicking off now, really pushing forward in regards to um, investor returns that Murph pre present, presented on earlier before. So we really want to start getting an understanding about, you know, what's the tolerance that people have for underperformance of their equities managers? And as it relates to Australian equities, um, you know, how long will you tolerate underperformance? Is it one year, three years? Five years, or you know, um, you're, you've already moved into ETFs, or um, or you invest passively, so it's not really a concern for you at all. Um, that's obviously not to say that ETFs um, uh, can't underperform because they can. Marty was going to tell me that, otherwise, if I didn't bring it up. Um, so we just want to kick right off into this session, actually. So um, uh, the two, present, two, two panelists we have on stage is Neil Goldston Morris from Ben Long Australian Equity Partners and Martin Conlon from Schroders. Um, if you look in the packs, you know you can see they've both got tremendous long-term performance track records. Uh, they both uh, have, have bring a, a, a ton of experience in Australian equities as well. Um, but you know when we're talking about uh, this disruptive environment. Um, the theme of this session is actually uh, taking um, how do you keep a long-term view in a short-term world. So Neil, I'll pass it off to you first, just to, if you can maybe touch on you know, how Ben Long does that and how it translates into your investment process. Thank you. Yes, um, we tend to take a longer view. The sort of stocks we like are stocks that can grow consistently over time. The cycle can help, but they're not dependent heavily on that cycle. And they always have some sort of differential, um, something that differentiates their product or service from the competition. It might be technology, leading edge of technology. It might be a brand name. It might be something economic like demographics, demand from an aging population, for example. And in particular, we like stocks that can translate that product or service into the global stage. Because in the end, 25 million people will not take you very far as far as demand and size is concerned. And you mentioned short and long term. I've been in the markets in 78, and I can assure you the markets are no different today as they were in 1978. People always worried about the short term, but this was the long term that always mattered, the magic of compounding. Um, I suppose the only difference is, if anything, the media has become even shorter term. Yeah. So it's really important to differentiate between the real world and the media, because most of the the two don't intersect very often. And we're not going to talk about fake news here, but, um, uh, um, but Marty, do you, want to, do you want to pass on your, your view at the moment on that? Yep, sure. Well, I was only 11 years old in 1978, so <laughs> I don't remember it that well. But <laughs> from our perspective, I think the easiest way to be long-term is just to always think about it as though you were buying the business rather than a share price. I always think, simplistically, thinking in millions and billions and saying, if this was my money and I was buying this whole business for this amount of money, would I be happy? Uh, that always focuses the mind and gets you thinking about how much a business earns through time, what it's going to earn on average, rather than what it earns this year or next year. And I think a lot of the short-termism that comes from earnings momentum, whether the next year looks good, bad or indifferent, to me, that always dissipates if you start to think about, OK, well, if this was my business, I'd be more worried about how long it's going to last. And particularly at the moment, with a lot of disruption and things going on, there are a lot of businesses where I think, well, asking yourself the question, will this business be around in 10 or 20 years, is a far more important question than whether and then how much money it's going to make next year. OK. So how do you, how do you stay true to your investment style and your investment convictions? Like, Martin, I'll, I'll go back to you. I mean, um, uh, I will pre preface this by saying you're, you're a gold-rated manager by Morningstar, but at the same time, you had a pretty shocking 2015. 
And, um, you know, in terms of how you, you, you say treat your style... I'll focus on the first bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, how do you face, you know, the demands from clients, uh, short-termism from the media, obviously, as well, and, and stay true to that? Uh, Neil and I touched on it before we came in, but I honestly think that clients get a bit of a raw deal most of the time in that I don't think most of them are as short-term as a lot of people like to portray them, and we've, uh, we've felt that... Most of our clients have been pretty good about periods of underperformance that we've had in the past, and the longer you develop relationships, the more they are willing to look through that. So I think that, that that's a bit overrated. But on the process side of things, I always use the car analogy that any process, whether you're building, building a car or investment, it's about doing the same thing time after time. If you're, if you're building a Mercedes, you don't the reason they have a process and the reason they have some disciplines and the way a car process is, goes down the production line is about making sure it's repeatable. And that's exactly how we think about investment. When we look at a company, make sure you do the same thing every time. That's, to me, the major discipline and that, that you need in, in terms of making something repeatable. Yeah. And Neil, I mean, Ben Long's had some periods as well. Yes. Um, so. When an investor invests with a fund manager, they want that investor, uh, the fund manager to stay, stay true to his style, his process, because there's nothing worse than deviating simply because of short-term effects. But the investor must also bear in mind that the, you know, the, the first rule of finance and life for that matter is the cycle lives on. And there's a cycle within the market, as far as the economic cycle is concerned, and when it turns up, the appetite for high beta stocks goes up for a short period of time and they rally strongly and then that fades just as quickly and you go back to um, our more longer duration um, equities, if you like. So that's part of the equation and um, you know, those times come, you weather them and you go on from there. Okay, cool. Um, so we chose uh, these two managers today because they do really have quite differing investment styles. Um, when you look at the underlying portfolio uh, holdings that they have in, in the portfolios, you know, there's commonality really only around the big banks um, and some, you know, maybe a few other, other, other securities. So, you know, I want to dig in a little bit more, talk about investment styles, talk about how they're seeing, um, seeing the world. Um, and I'll start with you, Neil. In regards mm -hmm. to resources, we are talking before yeah. about your exposure to resources. Um, uh, you know, I think at the moment you've got very, very little in, in the portfolio, but six months ago you were dialing it up. Do you want to talk through how you played that? Yes, so given that we tend to uh, look for stocks that have long-term growth prospects, deep cyclicals are a very different asset category. And we believe you have to be opportunistic if you're going to play those. We don't like to be in them long term. So I'll give you an example. Uh, we were zero to resources from 11 through to two, beginning of last year, 2016, because we thought there was a, a tidal wave of new supply coming on stream because of the lack of discipline from many of the companies. That would bury the commodity prices, as it, and that occurred. OK, so this time last year, or February last year, your commodity prices are so low, most miners are losing money. Yep. Good. That means they might get a bit of discipline. Secondly, that tidal wave of new supply had largely come through, so supply demand had a chance of balancing out. And then most crucially, the Chinese leadership announced a fiscal stimulus, which we thought would be in place until their election, which they have, by the way, later this year. So we bought aggressively early last year. Rolled forward to February of this year, iron ore price had gone from 35 to 90. Everybody was making bucket loads of money. Share prices had doubled or tripled. Um, the trouble with that is mines that had been closed when commodity prices were low were reopening, so supply was getting ahead of demand again. That means, by definition, commodity prices would come off. But also, the Chinese government then started talking about, rather than boosting growth, talking about, we need a better fiscal discipline here, guys, cutting back on credit growth. So we sold aggressively in, in March, April. Okay. And it's a very different investment style, Martin, Martin, in terms of how you've played it. You've been in, you've been in the resources you know, a little bit longer. Still there? Yep. No, well, I'm nowhere near that clever to know that I can get in and out at, uh, at the right time every time. And what I talked about in terms of looking at long-term value, we always think my fundamental view is nearly every company in the world is cyclical to, to a degree. There are different cycles. There's finance. You know, there are a bunch of cycles always impacting stocks. You've got the 
interest rate cycle where you go from high to low and it might go over very long periods of time. You've got economic cycles. It's about understanding all of them and try and working out where you are in the, the combination of those cycles. All we try and do is say, is assimilate all that information, work out what we think a company is going to work on, earn on average, and value it on that basis. So for something like resources, the reason we like them and why we bought them too early in retrospect is that we think on balance, they're very good long duration businesses. And going back to how long something lasts, we're reasonably comfortable that versus most stocks in the market, actually you've got far less far fewer concerns on the duration of those businesses than most. You're paying less for them. Yes, commodity prices are going to go up and down. We know that, but we also know that they're going to smooth out over time. And if you buy them at much cheaper prices, then effectively, and you're, you're willing to wear that volatility, the return you earn is much higher. At the moment, we'd say that technology, things that are growing rapidly in the short term, a flavour of the month, they often have quite small revenue lines and very big market capitalisations. All I know is you wouldn't want them to have a cycle. And not many companies just go from bottom left to top right uninterrupted for 25 years. And uh, that more cynical approach to cycles is probably what, what drives our view of trying to understand them, trying to value them and look through them. And how, how much are you getting, um, you know, are you looking at the supply side coming from China and things like that in your equation? Again, in resources, we look at it and think the simple issue of volume of commodities, it's been going up slowly for a long, long time. Yes, China's come along and accelerated that a little bit, but the demand for commodities basically has been going up slowly for a long time. And you know, our belief would be, and the prices have always been up and down more savagely in, in that environment. If China rolls over, yes, the price will go down. It might go down for five years, but in the end, it's not going down forever. And the simple principle that Neil was referring to that when conditions get really tough and no one's making any money, capacity always leaves the market and then prices go up again. The advantage we have of the commodity stocks here is that generally they're the lower cost, better quality players that nearly always make money no matter what the price is, that's a better position to be in than, than be high cost. There are a lot of other industries where realistically we're nowhere near as advantaged in the, on the cost curve as, as we are in resources. Okay, so how are you playing at the, the, the major, major resource names? Yeah, and again we're still, because simplistically the other thing that we think is really important at the moment is that financial leverage has had the payoff of all time in the last 25 years. The more debt you've had, the better. And that cycle, if you like, is a cycle that to us is wildly more important and no one thinks about as to whether that cycle might work the other way. Interestingly, resources now are the ones that have reduced their debt and they tend to be very lowly geared versus the average stock in the market. And in our view, the risks, therefore, are not nearly as high in resources as they are in some other thing some other stocks that people actually are very complacent on. So our view is that resource stocks are a lower risk than people think and better value than a lot of other things in the market. You going to get back in, Neil? Um, Have I convinced you? <laughs> <laughs> I've looked at them for a long time. <laughs> I used to be a mining engineer a long time ago. Um, they are cyclical. I definitely agree that the only resource stocks you invest in are those at the bottom of the cost curve. Because the bottom line is, when things turn tough, if you've got the lowest cost mine, you'll still be making money when everybody else is losing money. And I can guarantee you, the cycle lives on, and when the cycle does get down, most mining companies lose money, so it's crucial to be in the quality counters. OK. Um, let's talk about banks as well. So obviously, another yeah. big part of the market. Um, and and the, you know, recently, the, the, uh, with the budget, the bank levy came in. Do you, Neil, do you want to talk about how your view is on the banks, how you position within the portfolio on, on them? All our uh, funds are very underweight, the banks. Yeah. We, we regard, uh, and what Martin said a moment ago, uh, the leverage of the cycle has been taken to extremes in this country in particular because of a distorted tax system. Uh, the growth rates are very low now. Yep. You know, one, two percent earnings growth, it's very low. Yes, you get a dividend, but that's all. Um, but we find many other much better stories out there in the market we're focused on. 
We, we struggle generally with most of the 20 leaders. Yep. They are very mature, low growth companies that are struggling to find new avenues of growth because most of them are stuck within the confines of Australia. Yep. And that will only take you so far. Actually, I do want to come back to that point, Neil, but Martin, I know one of the comments you made to me a few weeks ago is that, um, um, you know, in retrospect, we can let the banks get too big here in Australia. And, and now, obviously, the government is, uh, was, you know, is coming, coming in and making them pay for it. Yeah, no, it's... And for all the sob stories that have been out in the media in the last week, the, the real issue is that the reason the banks are 25 30% of the market in Australia is they make a lot of money. And the returns are high. They're higher than, nearly other, than most of the other banks in the world. And that is a situation that, that we think is, is probably not fantastic for financial stability. They're intermediaries. And the cut that intermediaries are taking is very large. And that the ability, if you like, to put money back in the hands of consumers and facilitate spending has in some ways been compromised by the fact that the intermediaries are so much of the economy in this country. All of those things make us a little bit wary and at some stage say, well, in no healthy economy do we believe that banks can be a whole lot bigger than, than they are. Yeah. They facilitate credit. The more, more credit that, that is out there and the more leverage that the economy is, the riskier it is. There is no such thing as an economy that keeps on getting more and more leverage where the risk is not going up. OK. And I'd make this point, it's related, but it's still relevant. Most people tend to look at the current structure of the market and think that's the normal. Well, well it's not, because this market adapts and very substantially over time. I can remember when banks were 6% of the index, they're now close to 30 I can remember when resources were 65% of the index, they're now 15. Yeah. I can remember when healthcare didn't exist in the index, it's now a significant index. So our index, people might say it's stable and you know, relatively um, not changing in a, in a great way. It does and it will continue to do so. Cool. Okay. So where are you finding value at the moment in the market? Neil, you spoke about you know, outside the top 20. It's, it's a, a very um, uh, attractive hun underground for you have been along. Yeah, there's a few stocks in the top 20, like CSL, for example, yep. uh, which I think will be the biggest stock in this country in about 10 years' time. Yeah. Because it's spending $700 million a year on R&D. It's a global, world-class pharmaceutical, whether it be in plasma, uh, insulin, um, flu injections, etc., cancer drugs. Uh, and it's ongoing, it's growing at 20% per annum, an ROE of 40%. Um, but we're finding lots of opportunities because the world goes through, a, if you like, a technology revolution about once every couple of generations, one back in the 1830s and 40s, one around the turn of the century, and one now. And the crucial thing to remember in those times was that very few of the old companies that dominated the previous technology adapted to the new. It was almost like a complete changeover in companies yep. with that generation. And people tend to underestimate the challenges of a company which is structurally challenged. And I'll give you an example. Channel 10, a bit over 10 years ago, was $34. It's now 30 cents. That's structural challenge. Yep. Didn't matter what PE you bought that on, and it always looked cheap all the way down. That's the problem of when your market is disappearing for you. But by definition, something else is growing. And that's what we're looking for. Now, whether that be CSL or Aristocrat or Domino's or many others, Ramsey Healthcare, for example. Yep. Now, these stocks in some cases, like Ramsey and CSL have been in our portfolios and the largest part of, or largest positions since we started back in, back in 08. So whilst I talked about the rotation on resources, for us, that's an, that's an exception to the rule, if you like because the stocks we are investing in or we want to find are those that we can stick with because of their compounding effect. Now, I mentioned earlier the first rule of finance is the cycle live on, lives on. The second rule is the magic of compounding. You compound anything double digit, you will make serious money over the long term. But life is like this. If you pay what you get for. And I find it interesting People treat property the opposite way they do to shares many times. People are obsessed about value and shares, and that's fair enough. 
But I'll give you the example. Would you go, if you had a certain amount of money, would you go and buy a lot of acres in the desert or would you buy the same amount for the same dollars a place at Point Piper? Well, I bet you people would go for the second one most times. And you look in the equity market and value is a le highly legitimate approach, but you've got to be terribly careful what you're buying. Yep. In 1980, Santos was $4. It's still $4 today, and it's looked cheap throughout that time. In nine, uh, CSL was privatised in 92 at $2, it's now 138 That's the difference between a company that struggles to return, get a return above its cost of capital in Santos, yep. One like CSL, the return is, is north of 40%. Okay. Martin, in terms of your opportunities and what you're seeing in the market at the moment? Yeah, probably they'd broadly be the opposite of Neil's. But, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, that's cool. <laughs> but the, the simple issue for us is that the, we fundamentally believe that growing economic value will always be the driver and that, if, if you like, share prices have to track that economic value growth <laughs> in the long run. The fact, though, is that the economic value growth of something like, and CSL's done a fantastic job, but actually in dollars, it is not that much better than a company like Rio Tinto. And a lot of the share price gain has come from the cash yield that you're getting on the stock or the price that you're paying or the multiple you're paying just going up and up and up. And that's the case with a lot of the market darlings at the moment. The multiples that you're paying are as high as they've ever been and way higher than has been the case in history. So if you like, the, and the maths are pretty, pretty straightforward. CSL in enterprise value terms now is the best part of $45, $50 billion. And it makes about a billion and a half dollars US in EBIT. And it only has about six, six billion US in revenues. You compare that to Rio Tinto, Rio is only about 30% bigger than CSL. And its revenue is about you know, depending on the year and commodity prices, five to eight times the size. And over the last eight years or so, its lowest earnings in operating profit are about two and a half, three bill. So the lowest point in the last eight years for Rio's earnings was almost double CSL's earnings. And it had years where it made 20 billion. And you're only paying 30% more for it than you are for CSL. Those gaps in value to us are wildly out of whack and the, the growth people are pricing in a lot of those stocks at the, that have had exceptional stock price performance are just highly unrealistic in our view in the longer run, which is why going back to that sustainable earnings, we'd look at it and think CSL's done, a, done an outstanding job. We were one of the largest shareholders in the stock when it was on its knees back in the early 2000s and everyone thought plasma oversupply was going to kill it. Most stocks go through those cycles. It's had a lot of good years. We'd say uh, when the, the time when, unfortunately, people are the most optimistic is usually after the good years, not the bad ones. Cool. Um, we are going to go to questions soon, and, and I've got a few that are already coming through on, on the app, so thank you for, for sending those through. I'd love also to have a bit of um, uh, some questions from the audience as well. So, um, so we're going to have some microphones go through um, and, um, uh, as well. So if you've got a question, um, we'll, we will come to you as well. Um, but Martin, I mean, one point that Neil made was just the opportunities he's seeing outside the top 20. Um, but, but what's your view at the moment in regards to that? Because there's a lot of, a lot of um, money's gone into X20 style of funds and has been very popular over the last few years. Yeah, again, on most of our numbers, actually, the top 20 are better value. That, and logic tells you that as everyone piles out of something and looks, looks for opportunities elsewhere, that the valuations on those are going to go higher and higher. Whether you look at enterprise value to sales numbers, price to book numbers, et cetera, all of those numbers to us tell us that the X20 are at least as expensive as the, as the top 20, where normally there's a, there's a discount there. Uh, growth rates, and we look at it and think, growth rates for us are an input to value. They're not a separate universe. When you go to value a company, what you're trying to do is think through how fast it's growing and therefore how much I want to pay for it in those growth rates. It always annoys me that people think about it somehow as a separate universe. Every company is growing at a rate that affects what it's worth. And our job, if you like, is to, uh, is to assimilate all that in what we think is a fair, a fair value for that, if you like. OK. Neil, do you have any, any comments on that? Or? Um, I guess when you look, every stock is a human creation. 
So they're only as good as they, they, those people and, the, and the, the job they do every single day. Yep. So every stock, no matter what style you have, growth, value or anything in between, has to be monitored on a continuous basis. Because any stock is like any human. They get things right and they get things wrong. And you, know, you can have some of the, the, the best stocks in the world and if they start getting it wrong, then you need to sell out. Yep. Now hopefully they don't. Uh, and some of them get all right for a very long period of time. Uh, but that's the, the role of the fund manager. It's not a set and forget sort of uh, process. Yep, okay. Um, there's a, a question here that, uh, that has come up, um, and um, I'm actually, it's the, the one down the bottom. So while, um, while overall uh, volatility has been lower, you're seeing higher interest stock dis dispersion. Um, given this regime, uh, re regime affords a lot of opportunities to active investors for people living out active at, at the tipping point. So you're seeing more dispersion in terms of you know, your valuations on companies and as a result, is that more opportunities? Our view would be yes, there's a lot of valuation dispersion in our taking apart sectors. We think as interest rates have been artificially suppressed and people have been looking for yield in the stock market, that's meant that those yield proxies to us have gone to far more elevated valuations than a lot of the more cyclical stocks. That, to us, therein creates a lot of opportunity. Unfortunately, a lot of that has been sector-based rather than stock-based, so you're finding a lot, and the more that passive investing and, uh, and quant-based investing is driving things, you're getting a lot of correlations that we think don't really make sense when you look at the underlying economics. Resource stocks are a great example. We look at it and think, there is absolutely no reason that aluminium, iron ore, copper, etc., coal should all move at the same way at the same time, but mostly they do. The, the supply demand in all those commodities is not the same thing happening at the same time. They should actually give you a reasonable amount of diversity in economic terms. They're not in stock prices because you've got so many punters who are more worried about buying an index, etc. Those sort of things will create opportunities, but again, while the flows are being driven a lot by those quant strategies, ETF strategies. You've got to be prepared to say some of those correlations might prevail for far longer than you perhaps thought possible. Cool. But I, I'd, like, I'd agree with Martin on, on much of that. Um, we've been through the biggest bull market in bonds in human history. So bonds got down to the level where people were prepared to buy, pay negative yields for 20 year securities or 50 year securities, which and the great sweep of human history will make no sense at all. Because of that, all PEs have been lifted, regardless of quality, regardless of the, in many ways, the ability to deliver earnings. Um, you'd say REITs, for example, we um, have virtually none there. We're concerned about the whole bricks and mortar space. Most retail centres earnings are flat to declining. Vacancies going up electronic space expanding inexorably, competition rising, and yet their pre-tax PEs are above the post-tax tax PEs for the market. So the bull market in bonds has created a correlation in, in, in many of the stocks, which has helped ETFs, and that works for a while, but I go back to the, the first rule of finance, the cycle lives on. And once the correlation has been established, you can virtually guarantee that at some stage that correlation will break down. Cool. And it's usually virtually at the point where most people want to pile into that correlation that it breaks down. Okay. Do we have any questions from the audience at all, by the way? I've got a, micro a few microphones roving, so I'll just sort of check quickly before. Um, a question from the audience is, um, what's the view on Telstra? If you don't own it, you do. <laughs> yeah, we don't own it at all. Um, it's a very crowded space, so 25 million people, we now have four operators, all going to fight each other, uh, and plus NBN, um, which is problematic about what sort of service it's going to provide anyway. So um, we, we see the, the, the earnings are under sustained pressure, the cash flows are under pressure, the, the, the need to reinvest much of that cash flow back into the business is necessary, yet yeah, the payout ratio is very high. So the dividend yield, if you like, is, is exaggerated because the payout ratio is so high. Yep. It's got very little um, room for manoeuvre there. Martin? Yeah. As always, we, we try and take apart a business to what it does and say, okay, Telstra's 
a good business in principle in that our, we often go by simple rules. Most businesses with millions of customers are better businesses than, than businesses with a few. And Telstra's got a mobile business, a fixed line business, an infrastructure business effectively courtesy of NBN. And when you break all those, de those down, yes, the earnings are going to go down because they're giving some of their business to NBN. And that will mean that, like it or not, Telstra's earnings will fall in the medium term, but to us it's still likely to be a long duration stock and it's still a good quality business and their mobile business, if you like, and, as, and so on, is still the best mobile business out there. So we try and remain objective of, of, about things. Yes, we own it. We don't own a lot. It's not like we think it's fantastic, but we are always, always try and be objective about it and saying we know what we think it's worth and the more the price goes down, the more our returns go up as the price we're paying for the business falls, the better we'll like something. That generally is our reaction in anything. Our returns are driven by what the business makes and how much we're paying for it. The, and we have a view on just about every business as to what we, what we think they're worth. The better, the less we pay for that relative to what we think it's worth, the better our future returns. That's simply how we look at everything. Okay. Um, there's a question here about um, a company that's, that the global firm that name that's come up a number of times today is Amazon. You know, obviously it's coming to them to the to Australia um, sometime in the near near, near future. Um, the question is and it was around what will that be the impact on retailers? But Martin, I'd you rather go a little bit deeper on this topic because I think you've got a few views on retailers at the moment and just how much um, spare cash people have to to spend. Yeah, probably yeah. probably like Neil the. Uh, the issue we have with, re with retail is that the more indebted the economy has become and the more the government doesn't want to take money away from the older part of the population that has a lot of the wealth, the more it's hard to put spending power in, in the hands of the younger cohort and the more that, like it or not, you take that spending power away, that puts pressure on retail, anything consumer related that unfortunately are very large parts of, uh, parts of the economy. So as a sector, we'd say retail is probably likely to do it a lot tougher in the next five years because unfortunately they're the front end of the consumer spending and when people can't afford to pay their mortgage, they're more like they're probably not going out to JB Hi-Fi buying a new plasma <coughs> TV when someone's about to repossess their house. Yeah. And that, that principle to us says, okay, well, the consumer stocks will face the front end of that. Amazon, to me, no, that, yes, it's going to be an issue for a lot of retailers, but Amazon are a retailer like a lot of, like of other, and they've been around for a long time already, and they've been around even longer in the US. It's a bit like the Aldi thing. Everyone starts to drum up at a storm in a teacup when they've been there for 15 years already. The reality is Amazon's there. We all know who they are. Yes, they're going to try and take market share in retail, but they are not doing anything that any other retailer can't do. Okay. Um, there's been a number of questions coming through about, um, uh, about your view on Aussie equities relative to, to other asset classes. Um, you know, Neil, do you have a view on where you think valuations are for Aussie equities? I mean, you seem pretty optimistic about and positive on your, the outlook for your portfolio. Yes. Um, equities are a function of the ability to deliver <coughs> a return above the cost of capital. And if companies are inventing new ways of doing things, whether it be technology or brand names or, or uh, selling into a new uh, un untapped market, they can generate those returns. Um, when you look at some of the other asset classes, bonds, near to the lowest in human history. What, what about global equities, though? Global equities, you know, very wide asset class. Yep. Um, US is doing very well. Profit growth is very strong. Uh, Europe is recovering. Uh, the core of Europe, Germany, Holland and, and the UK for that matter, are uh, doing well. Um, so the, the earnings participation um, is more than there. Um, with that caveat as far as the change in technology is concerned. China, a lot more, you know, let's say question mark at this stage. Mm. Um, but that, those ingredients are very positive. And then secondly, the essential banks are going to be very slow to raise rates. They're going to do it incrementally and slowly and test it each time, see what happens. So, yes, eventually the pressures will be there from higher rates, but we're a long way from that. Um, so those two things combine to suggest to me that 
there is an awful lot of opportunities in this market. And the wrong way to look at it is the index, because the index is masking tremendously divergent paths as far as sectors and stocks are concerned. Uh, and we're living through one of those periods in human history where th those sort of differences are extreme. Okay. I was going to talk, uh, finish on active versus passive, but, but Martin, in terms of your view on, you know, your view on Aussie equities as it relates to probably global equities at the moment? It's obviously difficult for people in our position to, to make a comment on a broader universe where you think, well, we spend our time focusing on the value of a few hundred stocks. Some would argue I don't do that very well. But the, uh, <coughs> but the principle, obviously, of, in order to be able to compare things, you need to know the detail underneath global equities and the reality is that it, that is difficult. I can't honestly claim to know the valuation of every global equity out there. But uh, I'd agree with Neil in that the cursory observations say most assets in the world are expensive versus history. That's partly because they've been forced there and interest rates have stopped people going broke and stopped capitalism working the way that, that it used to. That's leaving us in a position where the cycle is a little different to anything we've, been, we've seen before, and anyone who says that they've got this, this, this licked is probably being a bit disingenuous. So we'd say we're in uncharted territory. I'm not sure that policymakers are going to be able to hold assets at the elevated prices they are forever, and that's why we think things like financial leverage should be issues that people focus a lot on. Leverage has paid you big time in a lot of the last 20 years, owning assets with less leverage, if you like, given that the risks to us are more likely that if you're lucky, they can stay up at these levels, but they might go down. The payoff for things like financial leverage, we'd argue, is behind us. OK. One more question, actually, we've just got that I'll finish on here. Is, um, from, someone from the audience came up and said, is there anything these two guys agree on? <laughs> we have very different investment styles. <laughs> But that doesn't it's invalidate. Young. <laughs> I'll agree with Martin on that one. <laughs> and as each year goes by, they get shorter, I can guarantee you. And also, the kids haven't moved out yet either, and I don't think they ever will, the way things are going. But anyway, <laughs> apart from that, um, just because you have different investment styles does not invalidate those styles. No. You, everybody has different tastes and so forth. But as long as you are consistent and stick to that way of investing, then you will get payoff in the long run. Yes, the cycle can run against you. It can run for you. You can't control that. But if you stick to your style and you, and you don't get wavered, and that's where the short-termism comes, comes in, because yeah. I can guarantee you, this is 100%, if you go the short-term route and you read the newspapers and take notice of journalists, you will buy high and sell low every single time. They'll panic you out at the bottom and panic you in at the top. And won't say sorry afterwards. OK. I think we're going to finish it there because we, we have run out of time. Um, but, um, but I'd like to, to thank Neil, thank Martin for, for coming today. And um, uh, yeah, thanks, guys. Really appreciate it.